Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Sikani Salman. I am the lead motion designer at Cash App and happy to be here at NAB East 2019. So I have a very cool presentation lined up for you guys, but before I jump into that, let me show you my reel. Okay, so for today's presentation, we're going to be talking through a few things. Um, so this is like my rough theme for today. It's taste versus technicality. When I say taste, I'm thinking more like the design, the idea stage of the project, and technicality being like the actual execution of that project. So this is kind of going to be the rough theme for today, but also using this theme to kind of talk through one project that um, I did a couple of months ago. The first thing to remember, right, it's a tool. Software is like your pen and paper. It's this medium to help you manifest your ideas, right? And the reason I say this is because, especially now when you have so many resources on the internet, it's very easy to kind of get caught up with the technical side of things, right? You could dive into tutorials for hours and hours, but then sometimes, like, your, creative t your creativity gets based on the technical things that you're doing, when, in essence, the software should really be a tool to help you create your own ideas. So let's start by saying that, right? But also, it's a balance, right? Every good project has a good harmony between design and execution. But the execution should be seen through the lens of design. And what this means is like, if you have an idea and you're trying to get that uh, idea across, the execution is the thing that should help elevate that. So say if you're doing an effect, you should be thinking through, well, how could my technical skills help me elevate that idea and bring it to the next level? Which brings me to my next point, which is reason, right? Sometimes, you know, you, you, see, you might see a film, it might have a bunch of effects, but sometimes it must, might feel like a little bit empty, and then you wonder, like, oh, well, how can I elevate this? But when you plan a project and play the different shots and different scenes that you do, if you think about the effects that you're doing and you put a reason behind it, it begins to elevate the project entirely. So it doesn't just become like a cluster of effects that don't necessarily make sense in a narrative. Let's take, for example, sometimes you might see a piece with like an amazing idea, but then you look at the execution and it's not quite there yet. But also sometimes you might see an amazingly executed project, but the idea isn't there, which then brings down the quality of the project entirely. So that's why I kind of want to talk through this theme of taste and technicality to show like when these two kind of live in harmony, it just elevates your project all across the board. So, Abbasi Rosborough. A couple months ago, this fashion brand in New York actually hit me up to do uh, a collaborative project with them. Uh, he had the designers, Greg and Abdul, really cool guys, and they make like these really cool futuristic uh, clothes, which I actually have on some of the pieces right now. It has really cool designs, really cool lines, really cool architecture, like all stuff I love. So it's funny, I actually met um, Abdul at a party and then they saw my work and then they decided to collaborate and we ended up making a film together. So before I continue, let me just show you guys that film.
this is actually the first time that I've shown this film in public. It's relatively just fresh off the press. So again, what we're going to be doing is just talking through how this film started from an idea and how it came to fruition with just one artist executing. Then we're also going to take like a look at a couple of the shots, how we did some of these things. So it's more or less like a holistic view of the project. So the project's about this jacket called the Ark Jacket, right? And when, in speaking to Greg and Abdul, it's really about showcasing this jacket in an interesting way. How do you tell a story? How do you showcase some of the key features, like the aesthetics, the lines, the flexibility of the jacket? So I kind of had to work with them to get that all figured out. So these were kind of some of the constraints I was working with. A very tight budget, uh, very relatively quick turnaround, and I was the only artist on the job. But also this project needed to be narratively driven. I had to pitch a concept to them, right? And I kind of had this idea, well, let's take this film and break it up into these like five parts. It's going to be this beginning section where it's almost like we're in this room, we're starting with this idea on this piece of paper, and then this paper comes into the real world and it manifests into this whole story, which would bring us into like the second part of the, the film, the form part, where we're juxtaposing the jacket against these architectural lines, which then brings us into the third part, which is where we kind of show like the motion, how it moves, how it flex, flexes, and then we talk about the sustainability of the fabric that we used. So again, it's like, how do we visually articulate these ideas? So obviously, I always start with reference. Let me just reset this. Uh, there we go. So I always start with reference to see, like, OK, what am I going to create? What am I thinking of? So I start there. These were the references for that room. And then for form. I knew that I wanted to juxtapose the jacket against like this architecture, so I kind of pulled from these references. And the same thing for the function part. I, want, I, I knew I wanted to uh, juxtapose it against like stuff stretching, like these organic features. And the same thing for the end with the fibers. I wanted to do something that felt very kind of microscopic and something very detail driven. And let's take a look at some of the exploration I did. I kind of like to start off pretty rough. These were like some of the very initial designs that I did for this room. Um, again, just getting a feeling for lighting, texture, all that type of stuff. What type of like architecture would look cool with what type of lighting? So these were some of like these initial frames. This is a shot that didn't get used. Uh, this is me trying to work out how this fabric could look. These are some like texture exploration I did. And I'll kind of jump into these later on when I get to this section. So this is just like different things I was playing around with. Uh, how these things could look, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, like I like to kind of use Cinema 4D as like a paintbrush, right? I take, and I'll, I'll explain to you how I got to this point with this jacket. But I like to just pose it, see what uh, compositions work, see what lighting works, and this is where I was saying like the taste, the design aspect plays hand in hand with the technicality, right? Where Seeing this through the lens of design, we're articulating, well, what angles, what lighting, what position do we want for these things before we actually go ahead and start building it out. Some more stuff. So these were the final boards that made it to the end. So just filling out the room, more greens. I changed the lighting here, made it feel like a little bit more homey. Architecture more or less stayed the same. But here you kind of got the compositing dialed in a little bit, all the lighting, all that stuff. So what this does too is kind of shows you like how the entire film is going to work in sequence, right? Because again, if you have a very short deadline, you kind of need to know exactly what you're going to make before you make it. So what this does is like, it gives you a roadmap to create. So now I can build an animatic based on this. So this was like the first animatic we did. And again, this is just to get a sense of how the timing is going to feel, how all these things are going to feel back to back, uh, what changes we might need to make, what shots might need to get cut. This is why like, doing this type of animatic is super important. And again, just doing something like this, it really gives you the sense of like, what's going to work. So when I put this together, I was like, OK, great. 
Because when you see it in frames, you're not sure like, how it's going to connect. When you actually do a little bit of motion as well, because you have the composition set up, you're like, OK, this is going to work. This is, uh, this is pretty cool. So this is essentially uh, the animatic phase. So we have this shot where we have these papers like flying off this desk, right? And it enters this room, and we have like this dynamic turning, and we kind of push through this tunnel. So the first thing we're going to look at is these papers flying off this desk. And you know, initially, your, th your first thought is, let's use dynamics, right? But for me, very short deadline. I don't really have time to iterate through like a bunch of different dynamic simulations. So I'm thinking, well, how can I build this just using uh, Cin Cinema 4D, native tools, dynamics, that type of stuff? So let's just jump into Cinema and take a look at how we built that. So I'm just going to show you the room really quickly. It's a lot of stuff, a uh, decent amount of textures in here to get everything done. But essentially, how I like to build things, I just like to build what the camera is going to see. So you're not going to just build stuff to lose real estate uh, in the software. So again, you're only just building what we need to see here. And everything takes place on this desk. So let's just pull up that scene very quickly. So this should be a stripped down scene of what's happening. So let's break this down. So the first thing I knew is that I wanted these papers to kind of like twirl and come up in a really dynamic way. So I was like, if I was doing this by, with dynamics, it would be like too many fans and like all this crazy contraption. Let's forego all of that, and let's try a simpler way to do this. So the first thing I did is I built this spline, which kind of showed like, exactly where I wanted these papers to go. And then I took a cloner object and just cloned some papers along this spline. So how are we animating this? We're animating the offset. So we're offsetting it, but you realize like, the papers don't spread apart when we do that. So we have to simultaneously animate the offset, but then animate the endpoint to get the spread. So then it's, it's cool because, let me just jump into the second view here. It's cool because it kind of starts off all at the same place, all at the same desk, but when it comes up, you kind of see them spread apart in a very nice way, which again is beginning to look like what I want. But now it feels very flat, right? You want something that feels like a little bit more dynamic. So this is where the displacer deformer comes in. So if I add these, you can see now like when they move, they have like a kind of organic wobble to them, which begins to make it feel like a little bit more natural. So what's happening here? So for you guys who haven't used the displacer deformer, it's essentially a deformer that takes a texture and displaces a piece of geometry in a certain way. So here we're using noise, and we're setting the noise to world. So what's happening there, essentially, these papers are going through a noise field. And as this paper goes through this noise field, the paper is deforming as it goes through. So that's what that displacer is doing. And that's how we get like, this wobbly. Uh, motion there. Just as an example, real quick, if you want to see what a displacer does, um, where are you? There we go. If I drop this in here, I set it to noise. You see it kind of just displaces the geometry here. Just turn this up. If I turn up the segments here, you can see that smooth now. It's I just increase the scale. So essentially, that's what the displacer does, right? It just deforms the surface based on some texture, which in this case is a noise pattern which we can edit. Boom. So very simple technique, right? And now we're setting this texture to world space. So now once we move this through, it's just going to like keep it wobbling. But also, if you put like a little bit of animation to it, like very subtle, you kind of get like some undulation as well. So again, we're just kind of faking all these tricks to get something that feels very natural uh, in the animation. Uh, it's not the right scene. 
Okay, so that was step one in getting it to feel like a little bit more natural, but then, you know, the papers aren't spreading out naturally enough. So if I jump back into this cloner, you're going to see like I have a couple more effectors, right? Let's just turn these on. So I have a random effector, which is just randomizing the papers a little bit. It's giving it some rotation. It's also offsetting the uh, position a little bit, and it's also varying the scale ever so slightly. So that's helping us to, you know, just make this feel a little bit more natural. And then you realize when they go outside, they all just kind of stay in the same line. And if you go to this view, you can kind of see that a little bit more clearly. So then I have a, another random effector with a linear field fall off that spreads out the papers as they go outside as well. So it feels a little bit more natural. And again, that's why I love Cinema 4D, because you could just layer all these things and create complex looking animations that feel you know, pretty natural. You would think you might have used dynamics for it, but then again, you could kind of add direct how things go, which I think is one of the strong suits of Cinema 4D. Then I have a couple of random effectors here. And that's just to give it like an extra hint of rotation. Just center this camera a little bit. And then I have this random effector here at the beginning. If I turn this off, you'd see they're all in like one stack, but then I have this random effector. So it feels very natural when the papers are on the desk. And if I play this through, it just kind of blew off. But then you have to kind of be smart with your scene, because you, know, you notice there's some intersections here, and this is where some trickery comes in. I purposely position these books right here to kind of hide that a little bit. So again, it feels pretty natural when the papers come up. And it happens so fast, when you watch the video, you wouldn't really even realize. Like, when we're here, you could even see, like, they're all slightly offset, so you kind of see, like, some shadowing there, so it kind of feels like paper stack. And that's just a random effector that's changing where it stacks in Y space. And then here's the last little trick for this transition. So if you look at our camera, oh, I think camera might be turned off here. There we go. So when we see our camera, there's a little page that's just chilling with the camera the entire time. So when the camera passes, and this is that page right here. So when the camera passes a certain point, this page wipes that camera. And that's what's giving us our transition to the next scene. So let's talk about this scene for a little bit. And it's interesting because this scene was like one I was a little bit worried about. Like, is it cool enough? Is it impactful enough? But it honestly turned out to be one of my favorite scenes just because of the feeling you get when you see it, right? It's a combination of a couple things which are actually very simple, but it kind of gives you a feeling that uh, I think is very, I'm very satisfied with. And again, this scene is like crazy, crazy simple. Right? It's a combination of changing the focal lens here. If we jump into a camera, that gives us this like, really cool zoom effect. But when we're thinking about like, how is this room turning in this very organized way, super simple. It's just a twist deformer. So we just have a twist deformer running through this room. Let's find that really quick. So we have this twist deformer that's just running through this room, but as it does, we're animating the twist right here as well. So if I just drag this through, you can see how that operates. But still, it's interesting because I tried a few different things, spline wraps, a bunch of different methods to get to this point. So it's interesting the R&D uh, process that like the simplest solution sometimes could be best. And sometimes the, the technicality comes in and going through a bunch of iterations to find the best solution, which a lot of the times is simple. So that's how we got to this point. And again, like in designing this, it was always about getting to a place where I can juxtapose this piece of geometry against the jacket. And again, so we're thinking about design when we're creating these shots as well. So the very cool thing about working with Fabasi Rosbro is these designers are super duper forward thinking. They design all their clothes in Clo and Marvelous Designer. So when it came to the point of actually handing me an asset, I had a digital asset to work with 
which nine out of 10 times um, probably wouldn't happen. So I had a great base to build from, which was super dope. And again, like if you look at the jacket itself, there's a lot of detail here. If you go to the inside of the jacket, there's zippers, there's all kinds of stuff. And this is something that these fashion designers are building, which is uh, pretty awesome. So you kind of see in here, right, they put the zippers, all the inner paneling, all that kind of stuff, which is, uh, again, pretty incredible. So that's kind of the first assets I got. After that, I got super excited. I was like, wow, this is super dope. And this was like the very, very, very first render that I did. No, it was, I thought it was cool in retrospect. It wasn't that great. Like a lot of the aspects of the jacket needed tweaking. Uh, so I had to jump back into Marvelous and just do some tweaks to make it feel like a little bit more realistic. So these were like a couple test shots that I did for this jacket. Uh, these were like some flexing tests that I did. And these are all being simulated in Marvelous Designer. Which is cool because Marvelous has a really, really good workflow where you can just export an Alembic file and just bring it into Cinema 4D. So these are being simulated in Marvelous Designer, but then being shaded with Redshift and Cinema 4D, which is like my definite preferred workflow. So just another test. So again, I'm just making sure I have no idea why this one's not playing back. But again, like, you want to get a sense of how this jacket is going to react to like, different lighting situations, how the texture is going to flex, how it's going to bend. Um, so I think it was important to just do these tests to get an idea of how all that stuff works. And this is kind of be my process of animating the suit. So you have a rig in Cinema 4D, and you kind of animate it like how you would want that jacket to deform. So I'll animate that person doing something. I'll export that as an Alembic. I'll then bring that over to Marvelous Designer, and then I would simulate that jacket doing exactly what I want. So here you can see that jacket kind of pulling, all simulated with a good bit of geo. There's a lot of fidelity in there. And then we bring that to Cinema 4D with an Alembic file, which we could then clean up, add some subdivision surfaces, uh, some redshift uh, subdivisions, texture it, add some displacement, and you get a pretty nice jacket. But essentially, this is the workflow that I use, like most of the shots. And again, for a project like this, when you have, I don't know, 15, 16 shots that you're doing by yourself, you're rendering it at home with your computer, you have to kind of create a workflow that you could kind of iterate with and do like a lot of shots with, because there's a lot of shots of the jacket. So once I got that workflow done, it was working. I was like, yes, I could just kick out a bunch of shots. And that would be that. Let's talk about this pulling cloth section. There's this section where we kind of see like this cloth pulling. And we're juxtaposing that with like how flexible the jacket actually is. So let's kind of discuss how we did that. And again, like me thinking technical, I'm like, all right, let me jump into Houdini. Let me use Vellum. It's going to be... It's going to work perfectly. And then I did that in Houdini. I'm like, wow, why is this taking so long to simulate? And then I was like, oh, well, Cinnamon X Particles has an amazing cloth system. Why not try that? And that's exactly what I ended up doing. So this is that cloth system using an Alembic file that I baked. I'll just show you here, and I kind of zoom out and show you what's happening. So this is pre-simulated and baked out in as an Alembic, just to show you how it works, and then kind of show you how I made this. So it does that, and then it, it pulls. Just get rid of this grid for clarity. Let's turn these off. Turn on these X particles, and I hope everything runs smooth. All right. Yeah, it's a lot of particles. This was a pretty dense mesh, but again, it was very important to get the fidelity. Uh, so that's why I had to make sure like this cloth had a lot of geometry in it. So again, this is using X particles cloth system. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail as to how I set that up. I mean, it's relatively simple if you use X particles. You know, it's been uh, run 
through some turbulence to kind of get that really nice undulation so it feels really natural. And all that's really happening is that we're connecting it to these pieces of geo. And these pieces of geo is just pulling it at the right time after it's undulating to get that stretching effect. So then after what I did, and I got that simulation to a really good place, I ended up just baking these again into Olympics. If I could play it through here. Ooh. I need to kill these X particles real quick. But again, if you look at the shot here, and what's interesting, like there's another cloth below here, but again, you always think it's one cloth just because of how this shot is composed. And again, you just want to find a nice area. You want to lift it dynamically. And again, it's back to what I was saying about taste and technicality. Um, if you want to show something that's stretching, how is like the semi-easiest way you can do this? That feels really cool, but at the same time, doesn't take you forever to do. So it's always keeping those two things in mind during the process. An interesting thing about this project, I did it in two phases. So with the first phase, we didn't have this section. I made this section after. So this was like my first uh, version of doing like these kind of wires. And I was like, well, how do I animate this? I don't want to have to go and like animate all these individual things. So then I'm thinking like, well, I have this cloth that I already baked out as an Olympic. Why not have that drive that animation? But then it's interesting because just looking at it, you wouldn't necessarily know that those animations are like pretty much the same. All right, let's pull in this pulling string scene. There's a pretty heavy Alembic in here, which is that file that we saw before. It's like two gigabytes. Well, that's actually the Cinema 4D file, and I'll tell you why that is. So this is that shot. Uh, here are these wires. And let's kind of see what's happening here, right? So let's just find these. There's a sweep. So essentially, we have our same cloth, right? And what we're doing is that we're taking, if I disable uh, the sweep nerves here, what we're doing is that we're taking these splines and then we're using a surface deformer. And what a surface deformer does, it takes the animation from one object and applies it to another. So essentially, this cloth that we already animated and baked is pushing the animation for these splines. So these are the splines here, and we're getting the animation from this. So if I just scrub through, you can see these lines moving on the surface of this cloth. So again, this is just free animation. I'm like, well, I did this already. Why not just use it again? So this is exactly what I did. Ooh. So I could kind of actually sh redo this really quickly in a separate scene to kind of show that process. All right, let's just build a new scene. Let's just copy that over again. Copy. Ooh. All right, let me just copy this in again. All right, back in business. So that plays pretty nicely. So let's take another plane. Let's just match it pretty much to how we want it here. And then let's enable the lines to kind of see our geometry. And we're going to be focused on the one we want to create. So depending on how dense you want these wires, that's how many subdivisions you want. But you want to make sure to add enough subdivisions so they can actually deform with the cloth. So I'm just going to turn up these subdivisions real quick. So you want to make that plane editable. That's the first thing. Then we want to select all these points. Actually, no, you want to select all the lines. Then we want to do mesh, commands, edge to spline. And what that does, it pulls out all the edges as splines from that plane. So if I just turn this off, boom, you can just see this all is just splines. But now we just want the uh, vertical splines, right? So what we're going to do here, we're going to take the points, 
if you just select all the points on the end and hit UW, which is select connected, so you're going to select all the points that's connected uh, horizontally, and we hit delete. Now we only have like these vertical points, which is pretty cool. So now if I take, go into deformers, I take a surface deformer, I put this here. It's really simple. If I drop this Olympic in and I hit initialize, right, it just loads everything up. Then when I play it through, you can see it's already beginning to take that animation. Now, to get this nice and smooth, if I change it to uniform, and just increase the amount of, oh, I need to put this, turn this to Bezier. You get more natural looking lines. There we go. So again, this is something that's like relatively simple, but because we had this cloth sim done, it was like we we're getting animation for free. So again, trying to think about smart ways to doing things that make it feel more technical than it really is. So the next thing we want to talk about uh, is this section, which I think is one of my favorite sections for a couple reasons is because it might look a little complicated, but in essence, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's just like a lot of little tricks. Let's play this one more time. I really wanted to do this fiber sequence, but I really wanted to get a very, very high level of fidelity in these fibers, right? So when you look at this shot, each one of these strands is geometry. It's no texture, it's no displacement or anything. It's all actual geometry uh, in the shot, which you know, could be like a lot to handle uh, for the computer to process. But I thought it was important to get like, that level of detail. But I needed to do it in a way that was pretty smart uh, so cinema could handle all that geo. So the first thing I went ahead and do was just like, create some strands, right? And this was my first iteration. Essentially, what I did, um, let me just turn this off. Turn this off real quick. So what I did is that I had two uh, helixes, and I kind of just made one and then offset the other one. So you just have one, do a slight offset, so you kind of intertwine with each other. But before that, now let's show you this really quickly. These are how I like to make uh, lines. It's kind of silly, but I usually just start with a square, delete these points, and then subdivide it to how many points I want. And to me, that's how I, it's, it's kind of silly. That's how I like to do it. Uh, just center this up real quick, bring it back up. Cool. So this is like my first step. Throw that in a cloner real quick. Uh, you want to change this cloner to a grid. I just make this like really, really, really tiny. Oh, not the count, but the uh, actual size. So you want to make that super tiny. So there's just like barely any kind of space between them. And then to make them feel a little bit more natural, we're just going to throw like a Mogra, a random effect in there. And just really kind of dial back down. Let's do 0 0.01. Because you want it to feel like this natural cluster, right? And in this cloner, I think we could dial this down to 0 0.01. Let's do that really quickly. Boom, bam. And let's do 0 0.02 here. All right, cool. So this is pretty good. So at first, I did a helix, let's just scale that down, flip it 90 degrees, extend it really quick, uh, extend the height, and then extend the end radius, not the radius, but the angle. Let's really dial that up to like whatever. Uh, make sure the end radius and the start radius is relatively the same. Let's just do one, or let's just do 0 0.4. Cool, and then I use a spline wrap, one of my favorite tools actually. I just nest 
this Kona in a spine wrap. And I throw that helix in there. And it should wrap. I think we just need some more subdivisions in there. There we go. Change this to uh, adaptive or uh, this one to Bezier, this one a uniform. Boom, there we go. So I did that. And obviously, we could space this out more in a random. We put this to like 0.4 or something. All right, and that kind of gets us like as a starting line, but I was like, this isn't efficient. So again, I ended up just taking like the easier way out. I just took that out and I threw in a twist deformer and that actually got me a better look that felt more efficient. So I just made this small, lean this over, and let me just nest this into a null and extend it. Uh, it should be Z. Nope. Oh, yeah, it's laying down. Cool. Yeah, and you just turn this angle all the way up. Let's make it smaller. Just need to dial the height in. Yeah, and you just need to make sure it's centered with the actual uh, line itself. Yeah, and then you begin to get like a really cool twisty pattern that feels really natural. And again, like that, I just jump back into this file where I should actually have one of those made. Well, I think these were the older patterns. Anyway, let's jump into the more fun stuff. So even after making this, I was like, I have no idea what to do with this, and I have no idea how to animate it. So what do I do? Uh, so I was just doing like a bunch of experiments as I was doing, explaining before, like when I do something, I like to do a lot of exploration. So I was doing a bunch of stuff like this to see like, oh, how could this look? And I kind of stumbled on this by accident. So, so I actually have those fibers in here. I know it's a lot. You can't see them just because there's so many splines, but they're all in here. But I'm just using these cylinders as proxies, so it's just easier to visualize. So when I rendered these, these look really uh, uniform. So to break those up, I did a random effector to just kind of rotate it a little bit. I can't remember what I was doing, but like, I threw a bender form in here, and I was like, yo, this looks dope. And then I was like, well, I could use this to make a composition, I could kind of tell a story with this. So again, it's like seeing these compositions and lockups and figuring out like, okay, how can I turn this into a narrative, right? So just kind of playing around to see how that could animate. Uh, if you just move this cloner through it, you kind of get like a cool animation. And I was like, it looks pretty simple, but depending on how you, like, you focus your camera and what angles and compositions you do, uh, it could look pretty dope. So I kind of started with that as my base. Um, then I was playing around with a couple different things with like circular patterns. I think I have that in another file. Let's pop that open. So OK, another big con constraint that I forgot to mention. Like one of these fibers was so heavy, the only way I could do animation was if I instanced them in a cloner. So they're all instanced, right? If I were to not instance, it would just be too much geometry, which is a huge limitation because when something is instance, if you add a deformer to that one thing, it's going to affect all the clones. So you couldn't, you couldn't say push this through like a noise feel and it feel organic just because one deformer affects each one the same. So because that was the case, uh, I had to figure out funny ways in doing things. So let me just turn on my proxy here just to make everything easier to look at. So I was like, OK, what can I do here that looks kind of cool, but not complicated? So I kind of have this wrapping sequence. And this one is like relatively simple to do. It's actually very easy to do. So it's a helix. 
Let me just turn off everything. OK, cool. So we start with this helix right here. And we're taking our main fiber, which is here. I'll just use the proxy just because it's way quicker. And then we're using a spine, a spline wrap to just wrap that around this helix. So now we have that piece of geo wrapped around this helix. And then we're going to throw that in a cloner. So let me just kill a couple of this one random effect, all right? So we have that in this cloner. Let me just turn these off. So we have that in this cloner, and then that's offset right here to kind of get like this natural looking thing. So if I put this to zero, it looks like this. If I just offset it in Y, we get that. But then, ooh, what's the original figure I had on this? Let's just undo. Now all I did is just add a random effector, and I just changed the position slightly. I gave it a little bit of scale. I just rotated it, and all of a sudden, it looks a lot more natural. And that's the key to making things look good. Variation, 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 making it look like imperfect, and suddenly it feels a lot more natural. But it's interesting because I had to go through so many different iterations to get to this point. So it's like this combination of thinking through design, but also the technical at the same time, to kind of land at a good medium between the two. And it was pretty much the same procedure for this one. So this one kind of stems from what we saw two scenes back, where we have that bend deformer. Let me just use the proxies for ease of view. So this is just a bunch of deformers. Uh, yeah, a bunch of deformers. So it's the same thing, right? Let me just turn off these more graph objects. So it's the same thing. We just have that one thing cloned and instanced. Then I'm using a random effector to just give it some random rotation. Another random effector to just give it some offset on the edges to make it feel like a little bit more natural. Then we're using a bend deformer. So check this out. This is how the bend deformer would look without any more graph on it. Because again, because it's instance, you bend one thing, it's going to bend them all. So we just have this one bend deformer here that's bending one of these things. But because now I'm randomly rotating each one, we get this, because each one of these things are just being randomly rotated. And then again, if we offset it, it begins to look like, wow, these things are kind of coming from every direction, and they seem like a little bit more art-directed. So I actually showed this scene to my girlfriend. She was like, uh, you know, this looks a little bit plain. I like how the first ones were curling up. If I go back to the scene. So I was like, yeah, that's a good point. What if I just threw a twister form in there, and then boom, it looks like that. And again, these are all like really simple tools in cinema. And this, but it's funny because you have to place this twist deformer in like a very specific place and like have the feel affected in a very specific way to get the very specific look. So it's a little bit intricate depending on how you do it. Uh, but yeah, it takes some time to kind of figure out the simplicity and what you're doing. So and how this is animating, we're just pushing through we're just pushing this cloner through the, all this stuff. That's all we're doing. Super simple. And again, that's the power of Cinema 4D. You can, you can just do really simple stuff that looks complicated. So the final thing I did, if you, if you jump back into the actual scene, we actually kind of see like there's a waviness to it. And then it just kind of like comes together. So you always kind of almost kind of feels like it's coming from this area of being natural and disorganized to being very orderly. And this was another happy accident. I think I was just throwing in the formats to see like what works, what works, what works. And I'll just pull that scene up real quick. So really, it's the exact same setup, right? It's literally the exact same setup. But all we did is that we threw in a formula effector in there. 
And again, I'm just going to put the proxy on just because it's easier to see. You put a formula in here, and then suddenly everything just got like this wavy effect. And again, because, because we're using this offset, it just helps it to look way more natural. And for you people that use a formula effector, it's essentially like a sine wave. So it's just giving like everything a little ripple. But because each one is offset, it begins to look super natural. So we could animate the size of this, um, of this formula, right, as it's going down. So that's essentially what's happening. As we're pushing this cloner through, I'm animating down this formula effector, which makes it seem like it's just closing in. Now, it's interesting, right? From this perspective, uh, it may not look as cool. You might reveal the trick. But if you take a camera and you position it well, you compose your shot well in a way that feels dynamic, you can make something feel like a lot more complex than it really is. And that's why I always say like, the technical should always be driven by design because you could achieve a lot more if you're thinking through what you're doing in a design way. So I'm always like, okay, how does the shot look? How does the shot look? How is it interfacing with the technical stuff that I'm doing? That's pretty much how we did that shot. Let me see if I have anything else. Matt, how are we doing for time? All right. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, yeah. Any questions? I'll just let this play one more time. It's muted, so you could just you could go ahead. I could just let it play with sound then. Just one more big thing. I want to do a huge shout out to Jordan Solomon for doing the sound design for this. He and his buddy Lucas did a fantastic job. So if you're looking for sound design, hit that guy up. Uh, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs>